Hello everyone and welcome to this eChurch video for this Sunday after Ascension, the Sunday that stands between the great feast of Ascension and another great feast which falls next Sunday, the feast of Pentecost. This is a season in the church's year when we pray particularly fervently for the gift of the Holy Spirit to be sent upon the church and I'll be reflecting a little bit on that later on in this act of worship. As usual, I do invite you to use this resource in whatever way helps you to pray, and I continue to wish you all God's blessing in these strange times. What God has prepared for those who love him, he has revealed to us through the Spirit, for the Spirit searches everything. Therefore let us in penitence open our hearts to the Lord, who has prepared good things for those who love him. You raise the dead to life in the Spirit. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. You bring pardon and peace to the broken in heart. Christ, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. You make one by your spirit the torn and divided. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Almighty God, who forgives all who truly repent, have mercy upon you. Pardon and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and keep you in life eternal. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Risen, ascended Lord, as we rejoice at your triumph, fill your church on earth with power and compassion, that all who are estranged by sin may find forgiveness and know your peace, to the glory of God the Father. Amen. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, is this the time when you will restore the kingdom to Israel? He replied, It is not for you to know the times or periods that the Father has set by his own authority. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. When he had said this, as they were watching, he was lifted up, and a cloud took him out of their sight. While he was going, and they were gazing up towards heaven, suddenly two men in white robes stood by them. They said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking up towards heaven? This Jesus, who has been taken from you into heaven, will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. Then they returned to Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is near Jerusalem a Sabbath day journey away. When they had entered the city, they went to the room upstairs where they were staying, Peter and John and James and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James, son of Alphaeus, and Simon the Zealot, and Judas, son of James. 
All these were constantly devoting themselves to prayer, together with certain women, including Mary, the mother of Jesus, as well as his brothers. Let God arise and let his enemies be scattered. Let those that hate him flee before him. As, As the, the smoke, smoke vanishes, vanishes, so may they vanish away. away. As, As wax, wax melts, melts at the fire, so, so let, let the wicked, wicked perish at the presence of God. But let the righteous be glad and rejoice before God. Let them make merry with gladness. Sing, sing to God, God sing, sing praises to his name. Exalt him who rides on the clouds. The Lord, the Lord is his name. Rejoice, rejoice before him. him. Father of the fatherless, defender of widows, God in his holy habitation. God, God gives, gives the solitary a home and brings forth prisoners to songs of welcome, but the, but the rebellious, rebellious inhabit a burning desert. desert. O God, when you went forth before your people, when you marched through the wilderness, the earth, the earth shook and, and the heavens dropped down rain at the presence of God, the Lord of Sinai, at the, at the presence of God, of God the, the God, God of, of Israel. Israel. You sent down a gracious rain, O God. You refreshed your inheritance when it was weary. Your, your people, people came, came to dwell, dwell there. In your, in goodness, your goodness, O God, God you provide, you provide for, the poor. for the poor. Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal that is taking place among you to test you as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice in so far as you are sharing Christ's sufferings, so that you may also be glad and shout for joy when his glory is revealed. If you are reviled for the name of Christ, you are blessed, because the spirit of glory, which is the spirit of God, is resting on you. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that he may exalt you in due time. Cast all your anxiety on him, because he cares for you. Discipline yourselves. Keep alert. Like a roaring lion, your adversary the devil prowls around, looking for someone to devour. Resist him, steadfast in your faith, for you know that your brothers and sisters throughout the world are undergoing the same kinds of suffering. And after you have suffered for a little while, the God of all grace, who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself restore, support, strengthen and establish you. To him be the power for ever and ever. Amen. After Jesus had spoken these words, he looked up to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, so that the Son may glorify you. Since you have given him authority over all people to give eternal life to all whom you have given him. And this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. I glorified you on earth by finishing the work that you gave me to do. So now, Father, glorify me in your own presence, with the glory that I had in your presence before the world existed. I have made your name known to those whom you gave me from the world. They were yours, and you gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Now they know that everything you have given me is from you. For the words that you gave to me I have given to them, and they have received them and known in truth that I came from you, and they have believed that you sent me. I am asking on their behalf, I am not asking on behalf of the world, but on behalf of those whom you gave me, because they are yours. All mine are yours, and yours are mine, and I have been glorified in them. And now I am no longer in the world, but they are in the world, and I am coming to you. Holy Father, protect them in your name that you have given me, so that they may be one as we are one. 
Well, if one's allowed to have favourite Sundays in the church calendar, and I do accept that may be a niche interest, then the Sunday after Ascension is mine. It's a Sunday pregnant with expectation and with possibility. Like the tennis score 1530, it has a dramatic intensity. More than the Sundays in Lent because it is one and they are many. More than the Sundays in Advent because it comes so much nearer the climax of the story. The Feast of Pentecost, which comes next week, is the last piece in the jigsaw, the moment when our annual remembrance of the great story of our salvation reaches its conclusion. Jesus, risen from the grave, has ascended into heaven and now sends his Holy Spirit on his church. This is the moment when the loose ends are tied off, the character arcs come to a stop and everyone lives happily ever after. Actually, not so much that last bit, but I'll return to that. First, I want to explore some of the themes of this Sunday and the nine-day mini-season of the Church's year that it falls within. I won't be offering an exposition of any one of our scripture readings today, but I will be picking out themes from all of them and more. Three themes, to be precise, that sum up what we're about at this time of year. To begin then, this is a season about the humanity of God. It's about the humanity of God partly because everything to do with Jesus is about God becoming human. It's what we call the incarnation. St John says that the word became flesh and dwelt for a while among us. And it's absolutely essential to understand that the ascension of Jesus, which we read about in the book of Acts earlier, and which we continue to celebrate throughout this period, is not in any sense a reversal of that process. Jesus doesn't stop being human when he returns to his Father. The same Jesus who has lived among us, who has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, whose risen body still bears the wounds of his passion, that Jesus is the one who now sits at the right hand of the Father. So the ascension is best understood as the church's affirmation of this culmination of the incarnation. The human Jesus is in heaven, drawn into God's own self. And that, I think, is one of the most extraordinarily comforting things about our Christian faith. The idea that there is a human being in heaven. As I said last week, there are many ways in which God remains entirely other, quite properly beyond us. But the ascension of Jesus reminds us that in other ways, God knows exactly what it's like to be us. And just as he prayed for his disciples on earth, as we read about in St. John's Gospel a few moments ago, he prays for us now in heaven. Secondly, and moving on, this is a season about the coming of the Spirit. We get three to four weeks to prepare for Christmas and 40 days to prepare for Easter. But we also get nine days to prepare for Pentecost. And during these nine days, our fervent, focused and faithful prayer is this. Come Holy Spirit. Let's be clear that the Holy Spirit is not an optional extra for Christian folk, an extra topping that we can leave off the pizza of faith. All Christians are Pentecostal Christians, just as they are all Catholic, all evangelical, all born again. The first Christians spent the time after the ascension in prayer, and they knew what to pray for because Jesus had told them to expect the Holy Spirit. Fervent, focused and faithful prayer for the Holy Spirit, I say again, is the hallmark of this season. And what sort of a response might we expect? Well, as I explained last Sunday, the work of the Holy Spirit has many facets. But today the emphasis is on one in particular. Power. Power from on high. 
This is the kind of power that does real work in the real world. The raw energy that makes things happen. And there are a couple of things to notice about it in particular. The first is that the Holy Spirit's power is the only power that has any place in the Christian way of life. Jesus tells his followers to wait for this power, not because they are, as sometimes has been wrongly suggested, feeble inadequates. The picture of the pre-Pentecost Christian movement is important for precisely this reason. The apostles obeyed the risen Lord's command to wait. And the sad fact is that the Christian church has too often, in impatience or arrogance, failed to wait fail to wait to be clothed with power from on high and has instead decided to proceed with its own agenda in its own strength. The second thing to notice about the Holy Spirit's power is what it does. Not in today's readings but elsewhere in the New Testament we learn that the Holy Spirit's work in the world can be discerned above all else by its results which St Paul calls the fruit of the Spirit fruit of love and joy and peace in the lives of the faithful and through them in the world around them. Finally, though, this is a season about the calling of the church. And it will perhaps not surprise you by now if I sum this up as joining in with the work of the Holy Spirit. Following the ascension of Jesus, the job of being the bodily presence of God in the world passes to the church. And it's a job that the church cannot do without the real life of God animating it from within. In recent years, there has been a renewed interest in the work of the Holy Spirit in the lives of individual Christians. We need not to forget, though, in our enthusiasm for the gifts of the Spirit given to specific people within the church, that the Spirit of God is given to the church as the body of Christ. Indeed, it is the Spirit of God that makes the church the church, since without God's life dwelling within it, the church is just another club. Our job as Christians, then, our calling as the people of God in this time and this place, is to try to discern what the Holy Spirit of God is doing, and to do our very best to join in. And it's worth noticing, even if it sounds a little negative, how much of what we actually do as Christians looks like, well, pretty much the opposite. All too often we seem to be attempting to get God to join in with our work, to sign up to our agenda, forgetting that the beating heart of our Lord's prayer was and is, Thy will be done. So our calling is to wait on God to listen, to obey, to serve, to join in with the work of the Holy Spirit in our midst and to see the church bearing great fruit as the life of God in us grows. And sometimes that will mean, as St Peter recognises in today's epistle reading, that we live through some really rough times, times when our faith is challenged, our confidence is shaken and our loyalty to Christ is costly. In such times we are called to depend more than ever upon the Spirit of God, to pray more fervently, more faithfully for the Spirit's anointing on the church and on the Christian folk that make it up. So my prayer on this, my favourite Sunday of the year for myself, for you all and for the church throughout the world, is come Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your people and kindle in us the fire of your love. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We pray for God to fill us with his Spirit. Come, Holy Ghost, our souls inspire. And lighten with celestial fire, thou the anointing spirit, would I
Just thy sevenfold gifts impart. Generous God, we thank you for the power of your Holy Spirit. We ask that we may be strengthened to serve you better. Lord, come to bless us and fill us with your Spirit. We thank you for the wisdom of your Holy Spirit. We ask you to make us wise to understand your will. Lord, come to bless us and fill us with your Spirit. We thank you for the peace of your Holy Spirit. We ask you to keep us confident of your love wherever you call us. Lord, come to bless us and fill us with your Spirit. We thank you for the healing of your Holy Spirit. We ask you to bring reconciliation and wholeness where there is division, sickness and sorrow. Lord, come to bless us and fill us with your Spirit. We thank you for the gifts of your Holy Spirit. We ask you to equip us for the work which you have given us. Lord, come to bless us and fill us with your Spirit. We thank you for the fruit of your Holy Spirit. We ask you to reveal in our lives the love of Jesus. Lord, come to bless us and fill us with your Spirit. We thank you for the breath of your Holy Spirit given us by the risen Lord. We ask you to keep the whole church living and departed in the joy of eternal life. Lord, come to bless us and fill us with your Spirit. Praise to thy eternal merit, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Generous God, you sent your Holy Spirit upon your Messiah at the River Jordan, and upon your disciples in the upper room. In your mercy, fill us with your Spirit. Hear our prayer and make us one in heart and mind to serve you with joy forever. Amen. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and for ever. Amen. is crowned with glory now, a royal diadem adorns the mighty victor's crown. The highest place that ever falls is his, is his by
The Spirit of Truth lead you into all truth, give you grace to confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, and strengthen you to proclaim the word and works of God, and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you and remain with you this day and all your days. Amen.